in this episode our discussion will center mainly around the impact of colonialism on the tribal economy and society obviously the concentration will be on the nature of impact of colonial revenue policies on the tribal world the basic lineament of the story is fairly well known as with regard to the settled peasants colonial revenue policy began to initiate a very significant transformation in the lives of the peasants there was high revenue demand rental burden increased substantially on the peasantry and eventually as a consequence of the kind of burden with which the peasants were saddled with because of the high revenue demand they were obliged to contract loans on a much larger scale than they had done in the past so the cumulative effect of all this was a certain degree of undermining of the social position of the peasantry and the tribal peasantry uh, also had to bear the brunt almost in the same manner but perhaps the impact was greater for the tribes for a number of reasons which we shall try to explain in the course of the discussion in this episode the dependence on the money lenders ultimately was responsible for the gradual loss of land since most of these money lending communities in the rural areas were also substantial land holders or rich peasants how in order to survive this crisis the peasants actually started producing on a grand scale for the market but commercialization of agriculture or production of certain types of crops which demanded greater investment of resources eventually failed to relieve them of this unending cycle of debt because of the peasants vulnerabilities to international trade fluctuations now this is a story which is fairly familiar and the story of the tribal peasantry in a sense conforms to this pattern because the experience of the tribal peasantry would show their plight as a consequence of similar disruptive effects on colonial revenue policy on their lives uh, sir how do we distinguish a tribal peasant from the peasants of the mainstream society then ah uh, this is a very important question but this is something to do with the definition of the tribe because tribes were of different kinds some of these tribes were living more closely to the forest some of these even though were dependent on forest were depending more on settled cultivation so tribes were of different kinds and their characters to a large extent depended on where they were located the extent to which they were already integrated with the wider networks of revenue or trade the extent to which they were had already become assimilated within the mainstream hindu society for example some of these tribes were more hinduized than others some lived closer to the main settlements therefore were more familiar with the laws and the logic of the market than those who were forest dwellers or who were somewhat distant from the centers of trade so the term tribe which is a kind of a colonial terminological invention the tribe perhaps derived from their own sense of european medieval and ancient history the tribe the term has often been interchangeably used uh, uh, with eth- ethnic communities or aboriginals but we can perhaps use indigenous categories like adivasis and aranyakas in order to describe such people who lived very close to the forest or were forest dwellers themselves i mean the part of the world of the forest depending almost entirely for their livelihood on forest resources but some of these tribes at the same time would be depending on settled cultivation but their contact with the forest was also fairly intimate because as we shall see that the forest rights constituted a very important segment in the life of the settled peasants in regions adjoining the forests for example grazing rights for example collection of uh, leaves for for purposes of fuel collection of firewood 
use of timber logs for construction of their houses. So the demarcation between those who are Aranyakas or those who are Adivasis has not always been very clear. Um, there is so much of interdependence. Some of these Adivasis were Aranyakas as well. So what, however, lends an element of distinctiveness to a tribal society is the greater amount of community solidarity that a tribal village actually produces, uh, produced. In contrast to the settled peasantry, which was more variegated along caste lines, along class lines, you have different classes of peasants. Some were middle peasants, some were rich peasants, some were small peasants. The proprietary classes usually belong to the higher caste. Some of those middle peasant caste who rose up in the social hierarchy actually acquired superior status after they have been able to improve upon their material position. So, in comparison to the more complex hierarchical layering of the mainstream present society, the tribal society was more homogeneous, more collectivist. There, is, there was a greater element of solidarity, largely because of the kind of village system which continued to influence the tribal world more than the settled peasants in the course of the 19th century. There were, of course, there were village leaders, and these village leaders actually regulated access to agricultural resources. They had some hand in the practice of redistribution of resources in situations where some of the tribal families might have been put in a condition where they needed some land from the collective fund. So then how far is the description of the tribal community as egalitarian valid? Partly valid in the sense that you have lesser amount of stratification in a tribal community. But to say that the tribal societies were egalitarian, I would say that this is an exaggeration. Because there were different types of people living in a tribal community. Some of these were the descendants of the original settlers. The families uh, which had settled down in a region by reclaiming forest. Such families always had priority. And it was from such families that the leaders of the tribe were always recruited. So such people who were descendants of the original settlers, apparently those families which had cut down the trees or cut down the forest and had settled down in the past, and this memory actually is uh, relieved through oral tradition, such families always had a certain amount of precedence over others. There were some, a section of the people who were resident aliens, for example, the artisans, because these tribal peasants were not in a position to produce everything. These were peasants, depended on settled cultivation. But they were not weavers, they were not blacksmiths. They needed such artisanal communities to serve them. So such people who were living within the tribal village and served the tribe with artisanal services were always tolerated unlike others who would appear as oppressors. So that is a problem. I mean, there is an element of a greater amount of solidarity, which is born out of the, um, the nature of the tribal economy, a yes, certain amount of isolation, certain amount of distance from the market forces, which ultimately accounted for the lesser amount of stratification, certain amount of collective control over the land resources, even though it will be a mistake to assume that land was held collectively by the tribals as a community. Land was held individually by the tribal families. Some kind of individual proprietorship, not in the sense of a modern property, but on the sense of a right of use, certainly existed. And these tribal families held property, held land as a kind of individual holding. Yet, at the same time, there was an element of cultural solidarity on which basis the tribals felt that they were a part of a tribal world. Some of these men would be inmates of the village, but members of the same clan may be living outside the village with whom the tribal related more happily than with others. So 
here the question of the tribal isolation comes in. Uh, Were they isolated? Or uh, you have, a, did you have a question? Sir, I was asking that if they, owing to the isolation, how did they relate to the outsiders? Now that is the point that we are making. That in certain cases, those who did not belong to the tribe, say, take for example, a blacksmith, a potter, not a part of the tribal peasant community in a village, but a man who is accepted as a part of the village, whose presence is tolerated because he is providing useful services. So tribes often used, particularly in these regions, eastern Indian regions on Chotanagpur, the Mundas, the Uraus and the Sautals, used a term called Diku. Now Diku means outsider. But an outsider who is an enemy, who is hostile to the tribe, not an outsider who has migrated to a tribal settlement in order to work in a tribal settlement as an artisan. It is wrong to presume that the tribals lived in a hermetically sealed container. They maintain contacts with the outside world. In the course of the 19th century, we have time and again found how influences of Hinduism had made very significant impact on the tribals, their social life, their religious life, and their movements as well. Birsa Munda, for example, the leader of the famous Munda rebellion in 1899 started as a kind of a religious leader whose intention was to purify the religious life of the Mundas in order to infuse them with a kind of active spirit. I mean, a purification was sought in order to revitalize the tribe. And an aspect of this purification was adoption of certain Vaishnava rituals. For example, among the Sautals, you have a similar movement where Brahminical rituals and ceremonies were accepted and adopted. So it is not as if that the tribes continued with their old practices from time memorial without incorporating any changes. They interacted with the outside world. They assimilated Brahminical religious uh, ideas and practices. But the men who came as oppressors, along with the new revenue system that the British introduced, or in certain cases, some of the tribal Rajas had introduced immediately before the imposition of colonial rule, men who came as Ijaradas, who were imposing heavy taxes on them, the men who came with Ijaradars to lend them money in order to pay revenue by charging a very high rate of interest. And in many cases, some of these landowning groups who were functioning as revenue inter intermediaries and such men who were acting as agents of the state by taking away a large part of tribal resources by way of taxes, all such men who were hostile to the existence of the tribe were actually not tolerated. And these were actually described as outsiders. Not those men with whom the tribals could actually negotiate, the tribals could actually interact on equal terms. And it is also the tribe has a sense of a larger space. I use the example from the Mundas that some people were inmates of a village or Hattu and members of the same clan who lived in other villages were looked upon as a part of the tribal world, part of the same community, and they use the term etahatulenko. So there are certain tribal categories through which the tribals were able to establish their identity as a part of the village settlement at one level and as a part of a larger space where men of the same clan, men of the same group, a clan group actually lived. So it is in this context one has to make an assessment of how the new revenue system brought about disruptive effects on the tribal society by destroying the village organization. Because once these intermediaries began to arrive, the leadership role of the tribal leaders, the Majis, the Mundas, became completely Redundant. The role that these leaders had played earlier in assigning revenue or collecting revenue on behalf of the state completely vanished. They didn't have any function. And this had started 
perhaps uh, a little earlier than imposition of direct colonial control over these regions. I have in mind the example once again from the history of the Mundas, the Nagavangshi Raj in the Munda territory. You know, many of these tribal Rajas were actually members of the tribe. They were tribal leaders and suddenly a stage came when some of these tribal leaders in order to acquire a more venerated, a more elevated status, started uh, proclaiming themselves as Rajputs. So they acquired a Rajput identity in order to distance themselves from the tribe and defeating the royal status that they claimed as a part of their royal lineage, usually Rajput lineage. In the case of the Mundas, you have this Nagavangsin lineage. They began to live a more luxurious life for which they needed more money. All these traders from, around, from all over the place, they would come with the luxurious commodities which these royal houses were very anxious to buy in order to flaunt their royal status. And in the process, they became indebted. They needed more money. And since the only option before them was to import taxes on the tribal peasantry, they employed new men who and imposed them on the tribal communities. So these were Ijaradars who were engaged by the Nagavang Siraja in the Munda territory. And they collected a huge lot of wealth by way of revenue from these tribal peasants. But then, this particular tendency became more magnified when the British came. In the first place, the revenue burden was much higher. The modus of revenue collection through the intermediaries also had a political intention because it was through them they wanted to discipline the rebellious tribes whom they often looked upon as wild and capable of very uh, of uh, rebellious behavior. So they were consciously looked upon as the agents of pacification. And these intermediaries in the process acquired an interest in tribal land as landholders by defrauding the original settlers. They took away their land. And once they established themselves as landholders, the tribal peasantry virtually lost their rights. Similar things had happened elsewhere too. But in the case of the tribal peasant, the loss of land was not merely loss of a productive resource, but it was a kind of a severance of his historical memory from his own existence. I mean, with land, he associates his memory, his patrimony, where his previous generations had lived. So you have a certain kind of cultural attachment of the peasants generally and the tribal peasants more strongly with the patrimony, which once taken away by these intermediaries, created a havoc, created a great resentment among the tribes. So this was one aspect. And obviously, when in order to pay revenue, they became dependent on the money lending communities, the money lenders also followed the same practice. I mean, they offered loans with which the tribals were paying their revenue or other kinds of financial obligations, but the high rate of interest that they charged, the meaning of which the tribal peasants often fail to understand, ultimately proved extremely ruinous for them. Lastly, you have this very important addition to the burden coming from the introduction of uniform currency. You are all familiar that we had in our country local currencies, all sorts of local currencies. Kori, for example, was an acceptable medium of exchange in many different parts of Bengal. But once a uniform currency based on silver, which is known as Sikha rupee, was insisted upon as the medium of exchange and the medium through which you could only pay revenue, the tribals had to go to the money lender, who is also a money changer, and exchange his local currency of inferior metal or inferior form with silver currency. And in the process, the money lenders would have great opportunity to defraud him because the tribal as is innocent of the exchange rate. He doesn't know how much value is a silver rupee contains or what is the term of exchange. Lastly, there would be taxes on certain items which tribals consider to be the things of household consumption. The British went to the extent of imposing tax on production of Haria, for example. The local beer in, north, in the northwestern Himalayan regions and the Punjab. So everywhere, 
taxes of new kinds were imposed on the Aranaka and the Adivasi communities with which they were not accustomed, which they looked upon as domestic consumption, which was not put up for sale, but for which they had to pay taxes. So lastly, you have an additional problem arising from the greater exaction of Begar or Corvi, as it is known. I mean, unpaid labor service. The tribals had to pay, this, had to discharge this obligation on a much larger scale than they had to do previously. So, if you look at this uh, kind of pressure, the British revenue system, through the local agencies of intermediaries, had borne upon the tribal community. You can see how the tribal world was undergoing a very significant change. It was turning upside down. But there is another dimension to this entire story where the forest policy also figures prominently. I mean, the early thrust of British foreign forest policy. I mean, how do you deal with the forest dwellers? So it was one of the questions that had bothered them since the early part of the 19th century, when many of these tribesmen living in the forest or living in close proximity to the forest started rebellions against uh, the kind of intrusion that the agents of British rule were making into their habitat. So it was important in the early stage of British forest policy to convert these rebellious forest dwellers into stable, civilized cultivators. The forest is a wild space where you locate these wild people capable of a certain amount of rebelliousness whose rebelliousness could only be contained by turning them into subtle cultivators. So that was the early thrust of the British forest policy. So was this the only motive behind the British forest policy or were there other motives as well which were perhaps related to the exploitation of the forest resources? Uh, not certainly, you are right. I mean, this was certainly not the, not the only motive, but in the early stage, the emphasis was on uh, conversion of these forest dwellers or forest communities into practitioners of uh, settled agriculture because you can control a settlement more closely than you can control the forest, a wild forest, I mean, which is more inaccessible. But from around the middle of the 19th century, of course, once the railways began to expand, forests became extremely important resource for timber, timber that the railways needed to, to make slippers. So with railway expansion, with the shipbuilding industry developing, there was a dependence on the forest as a source of a very important item, an important commodity like timber. So in order to ensure the supply of such commodities which had become commercially important for the British, they started actually demarcating spaces. Certain forests were declared as reserve forests. Certain forests remained open. There was a line of demarcation drawn between forest and cultivable area. And that had never been the case earlier. I mean, Arunaka communities would be cultivating a plain which is located very close to a forest. There will be dense forests, there will be less dense forests. From certain forests, they will collect certain commodities which were extremely important for their livelihood, like herbs or honey, herbs of medicinal value, certain food products that the trees in the forest offered. There were trees which were needed for producing firewood. The leaves of trees were important for them. So all of these forest resources which were extremely important for them, for their livelihood, increasingly became in inaccessible. Once forests became reserved forests, and once a line of demarcation began to be drawn between a forest which the government declared had its own property as a reserved forest, and therefore not readily accessible to these Aranoko communities, the problems multiplied because on the products of the forest, these communities had always depended. Taxes were imposed on some of the goods that they had traditionally procured from the forests. 
grazing rights were circumscribed. Time slots were created when they could actually graze their cattle in the forest. So you have a whole range of restrictions that began to be put on these Aradnaka communities, especially pastoralists, in making use of the forest. The grazing rights were circumscribed by once the colonial state started insisting on payment of a certain fee, such rights were customary rights. And these were very commonly enjoyed by the forest dwellers. Some of them were part-time agriculture. They would cultivate their land in one part of the season. They will take their hordes of flock of sheep to the hill regions for a certain other part of the year. So their occupations were not so clearly compartmentalized and the spaces that they inhabited were not so clearly demarcated either. So it is in this context when the new forest policy converted certain forests which were accessible to them earlier into reserved forests and thereby actually creating barriers to their free access, it had a disastrous effect on the pastoral communities. So whether it is the agricultural communities who are practicing settled agriculture, all the tribal peasantry, or the pastoralists, the greater integration of these communities with the market forces, because reservation of the forest came directly out of the need to market the timber. Since they needed to market the timber, the kind of free access that the pastoralist and other forest dwellers had towards the timber resource had to be cartled. Or you have this revenue nexus which was forcing them to engage with the market more intimately than they had done before. So one can wind up this discussion by suggesting that the gradual exposure of the forest dwellers, the Aradnakas and the Adivasis, to the market forces through the mechanism of the revenue nexus was one of the major sources of a very significant transformation in their lives. And one of the main features of this was the gradual undermining of many of the rights, customary rights, that they had always enjoyed in the past.